briefly about the uh, coronavirus again. Um, there's a lot of noise about it. A lot of um, reaction in the public sphere. And we've heard that there's been a case in Washington and a case or two in California now. Maybe more today. I'm going to give you some some numbers so you so you see what the what, what the reality of it is. Um, this is the topic of death by plague. The coronavirus. It's called the coronavirus. I I, I considered getting a picture of it. There's no point in that really. It's a it's a round ball and it has little bumps on it. It's a virus. And it looks, resembles sort of a crown. Corona means crown. Um, so that's why it's called the coronavirus, because of the physical appearance of the, of the actual virus itself. The, uh, the Center for Disease Control, which is our national um, health watchdog, estimates that about 3,000 people have died from coronavirus census, census identification. That would be sometime around October of last year to today. That's worldwide, 3,000 people. Um, the fact of the matter is, despite all the discussion, most coronaviruses cause mild symptoms, such as a common cold, that patients easily recover from. Uh, there are other strains of the virus uh, such as, uh, it's called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, we may have heard of that, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, called MERS. They can cause uh, pneumonia and possibly death, but they're, they're not at issue here today. They're, they're long by. Now, the, just to give you an idea, we've got 3,000 people who, have, who perhaps have passed away worldwide. Now, that's course important, but how many of you have heard of the Spanish flu? Yeah. Spanish flu happened at the same time that World War II, World War, I'm sorry, World War I started. Um, it actually started in this country, to the best of our knowledge, and well, actually nobody knows. It was spread like wildfire across the, the, the whole world. About 20, a minimum of 20 million people died in two years of the Spanish flu in, uh, from 1918 to 1920. And you can see, compared to the um, coronavirus, the, the virus that we're facing is hiccup, uh, a mosquito bite. The Spanish flu killed, and it killed quickly, and it killed within a few hours of some people. Um, it, showed up in the camps that were being, being uh, that were set up to prepare our soldiers to send them to World War I in Europe and spread from there. Um, so the coronavirus, well, nothing to joke about or to take, take lightly, it is a minor burp in the history of the diseases of mankind. It's nothing to be concerned about. Um, although our, our world today, it's a funny place because people are at the edge of fear in so many circumstances. They um, are just waiting to be pushed over to panic. Um, but I, I urge you to not be concerned, Spanish flu is F-O-U, <laughs> F-O-U-E, a flu, F-O-U-E is a uh, escape mechanism for uh, smoke. I want to, in the future, talk about plagues as they're described in the Bible. Um, the book of Revelation has significant information about major plagues that are coming um, they are 
the um, in which whole half and third of the population is stricken and die. It's a serious thing. And I want to someday, maybe soon, maybe not, address the issue of prophecy, the rapture, when, where, how do we look at it? How many of you know what the rapture is? You heard of that? Okay, that's a, that's the, the Greek word is parousia, it's the taking away, described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, there's this strange event where Christ returns and people were snatched up. The, uh, the argument in Christianity, in fundamental Christianity, is whether that happens before the, some of the events in Revelation, during or after. Um, There's an interesting controversy, not uh, very enlightening, but I want to, I want to look at that uh, when I feel prepared. Today, we're talking about Paul's history and the first missionary journey. We have looked at Acts 13. We're going to go back there just briefly. Acts 13 is the first missionary journey. Um, remember I showed you the map. Uh, Paul has, has left his, his home in Antioch, gone to the island of Cyprus, gone from one end to the other. Now he's taken the boat and gone up north to the mainland, what we would call it Turkey, and he's gone to a, a, a civic center called the city of Antioch. And we talked about this break, brief, briefly last week, and he's uh, where we left it off, basically when Paul explained the entire New Te Old Testament in 13 verses. Um, but the, the problem is, is developing about the great hostility of the Jewish people uh, to the gospel. And not only to the gospel per se as such, but to the gospel being shared with non-Jewish people. That was deeply offensive to Jews at the time for some reason. I, I really don't know why, other than they felt that, that they owned the things of God in the Old Testament and Nobody had the right to participate unless they were, became Jews, is basically how they felt. Well, the gospel, we, we, we've we all heard of revivals being major events in the history of, of the Christian church, happening in, for example, the Great Welsh Revival, 1910, um, and similar revivals that have happened throughout history. The, uh, but the, the the spirit and the and the uh, age of Paul was like a continuing revival, as people um, were exposed to the gospel and embraced it enthusiastically. Now Paul and Barnabas were going out uh, as they left the the uh, place of the city of Antioch. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas went out and said, uh, we'll, we'll come back next week and talk about it. And the next week, the meeting in the synagogue, um, the whole town assembled to hear the word of God, nearly the whole city. I don't know how many hundreds of people that was, but it was a crowd, uh, nothing like, something unlike that they had ever seen in the, uh, these Jewish quarters. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with je jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul. Um, the only thing I can compare it to is, if you ever listen to the news and, and listen to the political news, um, I, for one, am astonished to, to see the, the constant level of accusations against Donald Trump, against his family, against his policy, against whatever he did. I, I kind of got used to it during the campaign between himself and uh, Hillary Clinton 
And I did say to myself, you know, well, I'll be glad when this is over because we can go back to normal political rivalry, but it never changed. It's like there's been a continuing campaign. But this is exactly the sort of thing that the Jews were doing to Paul and Barnabas. They were saying, I don't know what they were saying, but I know what the things that history has reported that Christians were accused of. They were accused of using real uh, people in the, in the uh, communion, real blood, and uh, real flesh based on the teaching of Christ. They were accused of, of cruel things to babies and that sort of thing. It's just unbelievable. Uh, and this was a constant companion of Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, and this is what they said. It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, speaking to the Jewish people, since you repudiate it, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal, eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Now, those are an interesting language, isn't it? Repudiate it, and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life. Who um, would think of themselves as their, in their indifference to the gospel as repudiating eternal life and judging yourselves unworthy of it. That's how they're defined. Uh, God has said, I have commanded you, this is his message to Israel, through Paul, I have commanded you to place you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. I wanted you to be an evangelistic people. And the Gentiles heard this, they were happy. You can glorify the word of God. And, and as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. Um, this, of course, touches on what we call the doctrine of election. Which we're not going to touch it any further today. Uh, it's an interesting doctrine and creates enormous controversy in the Christian church. So the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. Um, but the, the Jews have cited the devout women. That, and when it says devout women in the Bible, these are women who were something like proselytes. They are showing up at the synagogue and expressing an interest in learning how, uh, learning about the things of God. And they're, uh, they were particularly targeted by these people. And they got together and be created a problem. Now, what I wanted to talk to, talk about, was this matter of shaking off the dust. They shook off the dust of their feet and protests against them and looked like Iconium. Iconium is the next town on the uh, on the river, or rather on the route. The uh, this concept of shaking off the dust of your feet shows up in the Gospels, and. It's more than a physical act. It's purging yourself of blame and fault and anger and frustration over things that have just happened. That's a tough one. Um, you know, we people, uh, if you look back at your own personal history in your life, and you run into all kinds of things that I could have done this better, I could have done that better, I should have done this, why did I do that, oh man. You, know, you, ever, you ever have these old <laughs> memories that, that show up un, un, uninvited about things that you said or did, uh, maybe in high school or sometime before, and you're just mortified by it, at least I am. I can't believe I said that or did that or behaved in that way. Well, many people carry this around with them uh, in ways that, that creates a, a, a split soul category. They, they become, um, they're not able to be at peace at any point in time. They might be at peace for a moment or an hour or a day, but then something will happen and it'll trigger a memory or a thought or a, an idea and all of a sudden they're, they're at, not at rest anymore blaming themselves, blaming other people, 
uh, whatever that might be. This is creates a, a, a status called a split soul status. Paul talks about it in First Corinthians, where a person is um, they can't make up their mind. They can't make up their mind about a particular any particular thing. It's always debating in themselves, always wondering, what well, should I do this, should I do that? Can't make a decision. The shaking off of the dust of their feet, what Paul and Barnabas did, they said, you know, whatever happened here, for whatever reason, whatever we could have done differently, it's gone. We're not going to carry it with us to the next town. We're leaving it behind. Just the physical act of shaking off the dust of their feet. Uh, an illustration that I've used, perhaps I've shared it with you. I see life sometimes as being on a bridge. And uh, maybe it's a bridge that's over the water, maybe it's a series of rocks that go through the water that you're trying to cross. And the bridge and the water comes through and sometimes you go, you're, you're, you have to cross the water and you slip on the rocks and you get your feet wet and you, you when I was a kid we used to wear the, the, the stupidest thing in the world was to wear thongs across a mossy river bank. <laughs> I, I don't know how many times I've done that and regretted it and ruined thongs over it. When we were kids we wore thongs all the time. Didn't really have shoes per se. Um, but I see life as like a river. And you cross the river and you run across certain water and certain barriers and certain problems. But you can never go back and recross it and undo the crossing. The water is gone. Just like the river moves on, the water is gone. You cannot go back and fix it, change it, alter it. You simply walk across the river there's new water there. And every day we have new water. Every day. And to be haunted by the past, whether, whatever it may be, is a, an absolute waste of energy and it creates a split soul person, a person who can't ever um, make up their mind, get anything done. We want to be a unified soul. Uh, the sort of person that Jesus described as who lets their yes be yes and their no, no. Um, we make the decisions for ourselves. We do what's best, the best of our ability. And that's, that's all we can do. Uh, I, I realize more and more as I grow older how not smart I am. I say not smart. There's a lot of stuff. I don't understand, I don't know, I could have done better, a whole lot of stuff I could have done better, starting in about the third grade, you know, and how I handled myself, how, what I did and didn't do. Um, I don't think about it. I just don't ever think about it. Because A, there's no point, and B, all it does is make me feel bad. There's not necessarily any good in making in making yourself feel bad. Uh, there's no, it doesn't help you. Uh, the thing is, you've got new water, and you're crossing a new place, and you want to take off those thongs so you don't slip around, and you know, if you can't go barefoot, then wear some good sturdy river shoes, and stay on your feet, and don't slip off move on. This is exactly what Paul and Barnabas did. They said, okay, that didn't go well, did it? In their summary of Iconium, they got run out of town. So we're, we're done. We're, we're not going to think about it anymore. We're moving on to the next town. And the interesting thing is, because they shook the, the, uh, the, the dust off their feet, they were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Um, they weren't beat up, they weren't, they weren't troubled by what happened or didn't happen. 
they just shook the dust off and moved on down the road to the next place. Now that ends um, Acts 13, the first half of, of the uh, first missionary journey. So what happens then is they go on and they shook the dust off their feet and they went on to Iconium. Now there's a, there's a series of towns up in the this area, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby are well known. Iconium was another place where they had a large synagogue of Jews. Now they're, they're skipping some pages, they're hopscotching down the road. And there's a certain wisdom in that. It's like MacArthur in the uh, Battle of the Pacific in World War, World War II. The Japanese um, put garrisons on on hundreds of islands to try to protect them, and to, figuring that the Americans would have to take every one of them. But MacArthur said, no, I'm just going to take the ones I need. I'm going to go where I need to go. And he hopscotched from here to there. To there. That was, was an easy job, but that's how he handled it. Well, the disciples are doing the same thing. They're hopscotching from town to town. So they go to Iconium. They enter the synagogue of the Jews again. And they have become very effective in speaking. They're good speakers, they're good communicators, and people really are responding to them. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the, gen the brethren. Again, the same problem, the same bad publicity, bad accusations, uh, challenges, uh, telling people not to listen to them. Now, you know, the odd part about that is what happens if, if some people are told not to listen to somebody? And they're curious. What in the world am I not supposed to hear? I want to know more about it. That's what happened. They developed a tremendous following. And th despite the opposition, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who is testifying to the words of his grace granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. This raises the issue of signs and wonders. Um, just as there are churches today that focus on tongues and having some sort of a special language experience, there are churches and Christian groups that focus on signs and wonders. And they're very prominent. <coughs> they're the the biggest churches in the world are signs and wonders based churches. Um, the, the great networks TBN, printed broadcasting, starting in Santa Ana, California, back when we, Lynn and I lived there, we are just starting out. Their whole message is based on the signs and wonders doctrines, and God going to do these wonderful signs and wonders. And they, they, they emphasize it. People flock to it. They just love it. Uh, seeing evidence of the uh, of what they believe to be God's working. Now, what do we do with that today? What does the Bible actually teach about signs and wonders? Well, let me tell you. I'm not going to go through to the passages, but I'm going to tell you in summary what it says. There are four places in the Bible, where signs and wonders are prominent. Four and only four. The uh, ministry of Moses and the Exodus, the ministry of Christ and the things that he did while he was alive in the ministry, the ministry of the 12 apostles after the death of Christ, and the ministry of Paul and those who associated with him after the setting aside of Israel. Four times in the scriptures, signs and, signs and wonders were prominent. Now, what God appears to be doing is he is confirming, um, how would you describe it? It's like the, the world history has certain crossroads. And there, one of the major crossroads, as far as the world is concerned, is, is the setting apart of the Jews, 
with Israel and the Exodus, the ministry of Christ, the ministry of the 12 apostles, and the ministry of Paul. And each time, God is sending his work down another road, another path. And he is confirming the fact that he is doing this by tremendous signs and wonders. The, the miracles of, of Moses and the, and the Exodus were really never repeated. There might have been pieces of them here and there. And uh, there were some things in the, in the ministry of Christ that seemed to echo those things. The miracles of Christ. I've heard it, read it, that uh, when Christ died, the whole nation had been tremendously cleaned up and affected and, and put in a beautiful shape. Um, but then they, he, he stood against the uh, religious leaders and they, they decided to kill him for that. The ministry of the, of the, seven, of the 12 apostles, starting with Acts 2, uh, and there were tremendous signs and wonders that followed those people. Well, these things didn't show up in the scriptures again until now. And the ministry of, of Paul, what's, what's happening is there's another crossroads. Crossroads of Israel, son of Israel. Crossroads of Christ, follow Christ. The crossroads of the 12 apostles, follow them. When Israel continually rejected the work of God and what God wanted to do, God said, okay, I'm, I'm putting you there, I'm going to go around and we're going to have another path. We're going to have another, another crossroads. It's going to be uh, the Gentiles now. It goes to the Gentiles. Signs and wonders again. And this is what's happened. City, uh, the people of the city were divided. Um, some side with the Jews, some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to stone them, be Paul and Barnabas, they became aware of it and fled to the next city, Iconia, Lystra and Derby, and the surrounding regions. And they continued to preach the gospel. Now here was a strange event. I've, I've scratched my head over it more than once. Uh, remember the story of Jesus when he went to this rural church and there was this fellow sitting there with the withered hand um, and uh, the, there were a bunch of antagonistic scribes and Pharisees sitting in the front row. And he was sitting, the, they, they placed him in the front row just as a direct challenge to Christ because they didn't want him. They said, you can heal people, but you just can't do it on Saturday. Well, that was true. That was their rule. It was a Sabbath rule. And they felt like that was, they defined that as work and God is, doesn't want you to work so you can't heal people. And Jesus continually argued with him about that. He said, look, at, you know, if you had a, a son or even a sheep and he fell into a well, would you just leave him there all Saturday? No. You'd do what you needed to get him out of the well and to, to take care of him. And he talked about the fact that this person has this need and this person has that need. And I, and I can't uh, just walk away from them, turn my back on them. But they never got it. Well, um, the same thing is happening again. For some reason, I thought about this at Lystra. A man was sitting who had no strength in his feet. That means lame from his, lame from his mother's womb who would never walk. I don't know if you've ever been to the Near East. Well, I guess it would be the Far East, wouldn't it? Um, but I have seen, uh, been driven down the, the streets of the Philippines, uh, Okinawa. Vietnam. And it is not uncommon to see uh, beggars. And I've seen them legless beggars, or people who appear to have no legs, and they, they get themselves a piece of cardboard. And they had to scoot themselves along with the cardboard underneath them so they could move down the street and do sorts of, sorts of things. Well, this man was in the same condition. He couldn't walk, um, and he was a useless man. They didn't have welfare. They didn't have social security. They didn't have uh, the, the things that we have today. He was, if he couldn't 
get people to have pity on him and provide for him with, uh, with what they call alms or coins or a, a crust of bread, he'd go hungry. He was in a terrible situation. He'd been like this from a baby, he'd never walked. Now, this next verse is really interesting, and I wish we could talk to Paul about what he was seeing. It said, the man was listening to Paul as he spoke. Who, this who concerns Paul, speaking of him as who, when he, Paul, had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he, the injured man, leaped up and began to walk. What did Paul see in that guy's face? I, I, if, if I were to talk to him, to Paul, I'd say, well, sit down and tell me, what are you looking for? How do you recognize that sort of presence of, of, of God's faith on a person's face? How can you tell just by looking at them? Uh, what are you seeing? I don't know the answer to that. I can't see it. I can't look at you and decide whether you have faith or not. Um, but in this particular instance, Paul could. He says, this, this man has the faith to be made well, um, you know, which is interesting in itself. Um, God just doesn't heal people willy-nilly. There's a certain, uh, when he does act, there's a certain element of faith or trust or belief involved in that person. And the man leaped up and begin to walk. And that had to be a sight. I mean, you think about it. The man has neighbors and fellow beggars who knew him. And maybe his parents were still alive. Maybe he had brothers and sisters. What a shock for them to see this poor guy up on his feet for the first time ever. And the crowd saw what Paul had done and they raised their voice saying in the Lyconian language, Gods have become like men and have come down to us. Now, um, then they begin calling uh, Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Now, when it says they begin, that means that there was a, uh, there, there may have only been a half a dozen people who saw what, what happened, but the word got out and people talked about it. So what, what's going on here? What what are they doing? And they decided, strangely enough, that the gods had come down. Now you have to realize, uh, and I've written Spider-Man and Batman. It, it would be the equivalent to Paul's, Paul's attitude would be our equivalent if somebody said to me, I just saw Spider-Man and Batman he was climbing the wall. I say, shh, I don't believe you. I don't, I don't trust that. I don't believe there's a real Batman, a real Spider-Man. Back in those days, their comic books and their stories were stories of these gods. And these gods could do amazing and, and, and profound things. And people believed in them. You've heard of the uh, death of Socrates? You've ever read that? <coughs> Socrates was forced to drink hemlock, uh, to poison himself. <coughs> The reason they, the Greeks did that to him was because he was not showing proper respect to these gods, to Barnabas, Zeus, so on and so forth, or to, to Zeus and, and Hermes. Well, these guys in the city, they have never seen anything like it. So they decide that all of these, these things, the only explanation is the old stories about the gods are really true, and these guys are part of them. This is Spider-Man and Batman walking among us, doing an amazing thing. That was the equivalent. You know, it got so bad that the priests of Zeus, so Spider-Man and Batman had their own little temple there, just like they do today, I think. The priests of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Uh, it was 
that it had gone that far. We're out of time for this morning, uh, so next time we'll, we'll pick up the response of Barnabas and Paul to that odd uh, action on the part of these priests. That's all for you. Excellent. understand what you were saying. Are you ready, Miss Edie? That's ready. Okay. If you would like to stand with us this morning, we'll do our closing song, To God Be the Glory, and then dismiss in a word of prayer.
Oh, and this is where my phone is and almost yeah, dead. So. Brings it forward now. <laughs> you want to charge it out? You want to see a rod as maybe? There was a. Uh, I saw. Uh, they surely sent me a picture. Oh. They said that they were going to go to present the gospel we went there to the Jews. Are they home? Gentiles. I struggled that way. Oh, yeah. They're home now. I never, I but I think I might have an answer. Yes, here. I'm kind of looking at it, so I just. So when these guys, when this. they started going See? out and actually so, preaching, the place they were going to, <laughs> to <laughs> seems to be the route where Already? the Jews <laughs> spread out. So they were they, they actually like physically going out they to have have a lot of and even the... No, like, we went there yesterday. I'm trying to draw a map in all this that I want. That it looks like they had a predestined course to go get all these specific towns where the Jews were. Oh, to take the gospel yeah. over yeah. whether What's her name? Chad. He's looking at her. <laughs> oh, sorry. I wonder if that is what that scripture means. Let's first go to the Jews that aren't right around in Jerusalem. Let's go hit all them first. And then you the want this Does that make sense? Sense? You what up? And, uh, you remember the, the it great tells mm -hmm. things that might be helpful. Oh, oh yeah, she can she reads. Just she always has homework for uh, reading. Because she might want to know him. Because it's for written kids. It's written from a Christian perspective. Oh, that's good. Okay. I don't know. You yeah. read it first if you want. Probably. My sister gave us these. Do you know what they are? You fry them. It tastes like shrimp. Okay. Oh, it says. And they pop up. Yeah. Is it like chips? Yeah. I don't fry too much. I had them at my sister's. At Nisa's. When you fry something, they fry up like little rocks. Is it rocks? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 The flavor here. is kind of shrimpy, no, vegetable. There's uh, another interesting way of reading in there. Paul, Paul was actually, writing, I and uh, try him. I think it was Rina Spain. would probably like him. If you, he, he was like on his way to there. Did he ever make it to Spain? Spain? Yeah. He didn't, did he? We didn't think so that was like his end course like, where he wanted to. Like yeah. Yeah. Interesting like that, when you like in the little put the little towns and look at them on a map, and they all match up, and you can start tracing. Really neat. Let me put this guitar in here. I'm going to continue on that one, man. That's it's been. Bye, Terry. Bye, bye. Have a good week. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh.